Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Very happy to have uh, Najib Ali uh, here today. He's visiting Microsoft uh, for the, uh, the Nerd Center for the whole year. Um, from UCSD. He's an economic theorist who works on a very wide range of interesting topics, uh, especially in sort of uh, game theory around social economics. And he's going to be talking uh, about a topic that I think is of interest to a, a very large number of people here about uh, cooperation uh, in social networks. Great. Thanks so much uh, for the introduction. Thanks. Uh, even more so for uh, letting me hang out here for the year. Um, I'm a frequent uh, visitor, so I feel um, embarrassed about a bit about the introduction, um, given that so many of you know me. Um, but I'm thrilled uh, to absolutely be here and tell you what uh, I've been doing and up to. So as Glenn mentioned, I'm sort of very interested in thinking about social structures and a lot, it's pretty easy for me to place my research on sort of some sort of pivotal moments in my life. The pivotal moment being when I reached, came to the U.S. for college from Bangladesh, uh, arriving in the U.S. with a couple of suitcases, a fake guitar, a fake Gibson guitar called with the name Gibson, not Gibson, um, and trying to figure out how to make my way to a place called a school called Brande that I thought was called Brande in a town that I thought would be called Waltham. And so everyone said, no, it's Brandeis, not Brande, and it's Waltham. And so that was the first thing I, saw, I noticed. The second thing I noticed is they actually gave me pretty good directions on how to get to Porter Square and take the commuter rail. And the third thing I noticed is they didn't try to steal my suitcases. <laughs> and that last part surprised me because coming from Bangladesh, I didn't quite think I'd be able to land in a random place. And, be completely comfortable um, trusting strangers. And that led me to be interested in thinking about social structures. And the, thus, I shifted from wanting to study math and physics to wanting to study the social sciences. I started studying economics, found it incredibly boring, and thought I wanted to do poli-sci or sociology, until an econ prof took me aside and said, look, one of the joys of being an economist is you can take whatever confusion we have about markets and extend it to confusions about everything else. <laughs> I'm using the word confusions. She may have used the word clarity. Um, and so essentially, a lot of the work I do is trying to understand issues of social structures, issues of power, questions of self-control. That's largely because I have a lot of self-control problems. Um, and so that's essentially what I do. And thinking about economics of privacy as well um, in terms of uh, issues of social signaling. So this, the work I'm going to talk about today is uh, joined with David Miller, and we're incredibly excited about this work because um, uh, we think it speaks to a lots of different issues across a lot of different literatures, both in and outside of economics. David, by the way, was a visiting researcher at Microsoft as well, who some of you remember. He was here in the year 2012 to 2013. This is a picture of him very recently in Michigan, um, where he's pretty happy. And David and I, two of us being theorists, you know, we, we did have a lab that both he and I used to do all of this research. And so I want to show you our lab. It's office number 12142 on the 12th floor here, which is incidentally the office I used when I visited in the year 2011 to 2012. I left on a Friday, and David occupied this office on a Monday, continuing the very same research. And then this year when I came, lo and behold, I'm in the same office once more. Um, so this is our lab. This is where we've actually never sat in the lab at the same time together. Um, but all of the ideas, all of what, we've, what I'm talking about really happened in here. Okay. So here's a motivating question for the entire research agenda that we have is trying to understand why people cooperate in the absence of legal enforcement. So this is something you want to connect to times in history prior to the advent of modern legal institutions as well as in developing and transitional economies where court enforcement is either absent or incredibly costly. So just to take an example from a book by Avinash Dixit, he talks about the Indian legal system. 
And a paper that finds that there are 25 million cases pending before the courts in India. And even if no new cases are filed, it would take 324 years to clear that backlog. So clearly, this is a setting in which people who are cooperating are not hoping uh, to rely upon the court to do so. So now you might think about how is it that people are going to cooperate. Economists have uh, modeled ideas of repeated interaction, where if someone cheats me today, I, I refuse to work with them in the future. Now, they might end up still being able to cheat other people, but you can imagine a simple social norm where if anyone cheats me, I'm not going to work with that person. So that's something I'm going to call bilateral enforcement. So now when I defect on one individual, that individual will punish me. I'm not worried about how it's going to affect my relationships with other individuals. Glenn. So, Najib, I know it's conventional to say that this is mostly applicable to absence without areas without legal enforcement. But I would actually argue it's applicable also to areas with legal enforcement in the sense that what does legal enforcement mean? I agree. Suppose that a judge says, you are condemned. What it really means is that the judge said something, and then someone will go and take that person to jail. Why will they do that? Well, they're afraid that if they don't do that, somebody else is going to do something, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the legal system itself is, in fact, a form. It's not, there's no ex external I completely machine. agree. So, I mean, so, I mean, uh, from the perspective of our modeling, it's almost something that economists and social scientists broadly have found it useful to distinguish legal from non-legal enforcement. But in some sense, philosophically, the distinction is very hard to pin down because in both cases, all that an institution is, is it's a coordination of expectations of what's going to happen. And so in some sense, everything is community enforcement. I agree with that comment. It's, it's uh, uh, the way in which we value laws is, um, uh, as difficult to pin down as it is to think about why we value money, in some sense, yeah. Um, okay, uh, so that's one scheme of enforcement where people don't cheat those, a person doesn't, cheat, doesn't work with those who has cheated upon that person. A more powerful scheme, which naturally comes to mind is that of a reputation scheme, where if I shirk on Glenn, Glenn might tell other people about it, and everyone else then is going to refuse to work with me. And that's a scheme of multilateral enforcement where each relationship is influenced by others. So these notions of multilateral enforcement have been incredibly important in economics. Um, so uh, uh, sort of a case study of this where he, that's been relatively influential in the field is that of the Maghribi traders um, that operated in the 11th century in Northern Africa. This was a coalition of Jewish traders who have, had faced the challenge of long distance trade. They had goods that needed to be sold in faraway markets. What they would do is they would hire agents in those faraway markets to do this, to handle all of their long, -term, long, long distance transactions. Now, of course, it's feasible for these agents to say, look, the goods spoiled while I had them, or something else happened to the goods and just uh, sell the goods and keep the money to himself. So what the Mongrebi traders did was they developed an information sharing network among themselves. So in the event that their agents did this, they would talk to each other about it and would no longer work with that agent unless that agent, any agent who had cheated, unless that agent sort of paid some sort of penitence. So this is a famous historical instance of uh, multilateral enforcement that in some sense began a lot of the literature uh, in which our work lives. Sociologists have been thinking about this probably prior, before economists. So this is James, a picture of James Coles, Coleman, who, as you can see, looks very concerned about society. Um, <laughs> and so he was thinking about the diamond market in New York City. So one thing I learned from his work is that apparently in the diamond market, one thing that's very difficult is, of course, verifying the quality of diamonds. So what these uh, diamond sellers would do is they would sort of trade diamonds with their friends, ask their friends to look at the quality of it. Now, of course, what their friends could do is they could look at these diamonds, which are va very valuable, replace some of them with fake stones, perhaps take one stone, so on and so forth. And so there was a question of how could the community get around this issue? 
And so the way in which he suggests they do so is that it's, uh, it's, uh, they live in the same community, they come from the same ethnicity or religion or background, they go to the same synagogue, and if any member defects by substituting other stones or through stealing stones in his temporary possession, he would be punished through non-economic means, losing family, religious, and community ties. The strength of these ties makes possible transactions in which trustworthiness is taken for granted and trade can occur with ease. Okay. These issues recently we discovered go beyond just the social sciences and recently theoretical biologists have been thinking about um, social norms in this way. So Martin Nowak, who um, runs the Harvard program on evolutionary dynamics, um, this is a review article that he had uh, recently where he asked the question, how can natural selection promote unselfish behavior? Various mechanisms have been proposed and a rich analysis, his analysis, of indirect reciprocity has recently emerged. I help you and somebody else helps me. Okay. So these are the questions that people have been asking. And now in thinking about what you're trying to enforce, it's useful to distinguish two different problems. And I'll tell you about which problem we're going to focus on. So the two different problems are what economists would call moral hazard and adverse selection. The second, in some sense, is a little bit more intuitive, which is there are good types of people in the world and bad types of people in the world. And what we want to do as a community is give the boot to the bad types and surround ourselves with good people who will always do the good and the right thing. And that's, that's a really nice way of viewing the world, but sometimes you might be suspicious whether good types of people always do good things and bad types of people always do bad things. And so the moral hazard perspective is that every person has the capacity to be good or evil, depends upon incentives. And that's the view that we're going to take, not because we think that heterogeneity is uninteresting, we think it's very important, but in some sense this provides an easier theoretical place to begin. Okay. So we're going to be interested in, we sort of model a lot of this process, we use the term ostracism, in fact this is the title of one of our papers, where we're thinking about the community practice of excluding someone from a society or a group when they deviate. Of course, ostracism also has a historical precedent uh, from the Athenian democracy where someone, there, someone would be voted to be kicked out of the city. Uh, there wouldn't be any formal charge. Whoever got the most votes to be booted would be booted um, and then could re-enter after about 11 years. But I'm not gonna say much about that. Okay, so common ways in which everyone, economists, Sociologists, biologists have modeled these kinds of reputation systems as the following. Either people have assumed that everyone in society observes everything, which is heroic, very heroic, or the assumption has been that, and this is the uh, model that both uh, Martin Nowak likes in evolutionary dynamics as well as economists like, is that we all have on our foreheads a label, like either G or I, guilty or innocent, that magically transforms after each interaction. So I meet Glenn, I had an I on my head. He says, okay, I can work on the G. And then I cheat Glenn. And that I somehow on my forehead turns into a G so that later when I meet Brendan, Brendan sees the G and says, oh man, I'm not going to work with the G. Okay. This is just a simpler version of the model in which we see everything. So I don't have to deduce from your interaction anything. I just see this label instead, which is much easier to work with. That's right, so this is, a, this is a simpler model insofar as this, this can sometimes be sufficient to do a lot of things you would want to do here. But our starting point in this inquiry is sort of recognizing that... So wait, what does this model work? So if you, we interact and you cheat me, I print guilty on your head? This, this is exactly not modeled. It's one of the things... It's, on your it, head. it is printed upon my head, a centralized intermediate... But God judged that you cheated and God decided you get that. It's not there's no game series that it's I... It's the mark of Cain. <laughs> it's not that I want to ostracize you even though you're a good guy. You never get uh, guilty on your head if you are... That's right, that's right. So there are no mistakes or problems in that process. Now you could imagine what this is trying to proxy for is the fact that if I cheat on you, you're going to tell other people about it. So it's as if the, guilty, the guilt is going to be going onto my head. This is trying to be a proxy for communication and this is indeed what we're going to try to study in this series of papers, is that is the fact that what happens in this interaction was privately observed by you and me, not by other people in this room. And so there are two questions that you would want to ask. One is, um, 
If you were to tell truthfully to other people what it is that I'm doing, how would we want to structure the social network and my relationships, my network of relationships, so that in the event that I cheat on you, bad news about me spreads quickly to my other partners and they're able to punish me. So how could we do that to maximize cooperation? That's the first question that we asked in one paper. Assuming that victims communicate truthfully, which is an assumption that much of the literature makes, what is the optimal network? But then more recently, we've had been interested in a more fundamental question, which is when I cheat you, do you actually have an incentive to communicate truthfully about what I've done? Okay. Yes? First question, it seems like unlikely that, that we actually, I mean, maybe there are settings in which we can structure the network ourselves, but certainly in social interactions, it seems like that's something I would usually talk about, take as fixed. So is it more sort of getting at the question of in what sorts of network structures would I expect to see a lot of cooperation? So, 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 one, so there are two reasons you'd be interested in this question. One reason is to be able to compare different network structures that we see, like as in a comparative statics or in a positive sense. Another is to sort of understand why we see the network structures that we do. So for example, when Chris Udry is like thinking of risk sharing in northern Nigeria. Now if you're thinking about like, you know, us trying to worry about, you know, my crops might fail or Greg's crops might fail, you might say to diversify risk, we should link to different people. We shouldn't all be linked to the same people or within the same village because we want to be you know, linked to people who have, uh, whose risks are uncorrelated with our own in some sense. Okay, that's negatively correlated. Um, but what he finds, what you often find in risk sharing villages is that people do indeed link to the same thing, that it's almost like a clique. And this seems very hard to square with sort of incentives to diversify, and that's something that we're going to be able to explain here. Okay. So just to give you a sense, it's this, this is the fact that individuals have an incentive to communicate truthfully is something that smart people take for granted. So Avinash Dixit says, I rely on the natural tendency of victims to complain to their neighbors and dares to pass on the gossip along the network. Matt Jackson recently says, if someone behaves badly, other people hear about it, gossip serves a strong purpose. And as we were combing through the literature, it was really only one citation that we could find where someone said, you know what, this actually may not be something you want to take for granted. Um, so Samuel Bowles and Herb Gintas even said something stronger. Though an active area of research, explanations of how private information could be converted to accurate public information in a population of amoral, self-regarding individuals, i.e. homo economicus, have not been presented. Okay. So this is in some sense what it is that our research is going to be trying, the second part of what of our research is going to try to do. Okay. So uh, Najiba, yeah. I know it's probably not going to be what you're going to look at, but it seems like one really interesting issue in here is when the information is ambiguous that the two sides get, and they might, in some sense, have different interpretations of what occurred between the two of them. So it's not simply an issue of telling the truth, but an issue of being fair to the people that you interact with or something like that. So exactly. So there are three issues in understanding this question. One is what happens when information is ambiguous. Another is what happens when information is unverifiable, where you know, I say Glenn cheated on me, and Glenn says Najib cheated on him. So it's a he says, she says problem. We're going to kill both of those issues by assuming that information, when presented, takes the form of evidence that can't be distorted. And nevertheless, I'm going to show that uh, in the most natural constructions that the literature has worked with, you're not going to have the incentive to communicate truthfully. So I'm going to try to stack the deck against me to try to say that there's something rather suspicious with the way in which we've been thinking about this. Great. Okay, so let me give the first sort of thing that we got in our first paper, which is if you, were, if you thought people were going to communicate truthfully or you were going to live, willing to live with what economists think of as contagion equilibria, then the best network you want to have are indeed cliques. You want to divide society into these different islands and have these islands be completely connected. The reason you want to do this is in the event that player one thinks about shirking on player two, you want information to travel to player one's other neighbors as quickly as possible. So it's better to have your neighbors be linked to each other than your neighbors to be linked to your neighbor's neighbors. That's, that's, that's the central intuition. Um, I'll go through the math uh, in the, 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 the,
Are you a bounded degree or something? Or? Exactly. So, so if I thought about the best network among all networks with the maximal degree of D, the best will be the clique of degree D. Now, so this was in our first paper. In our second paper, um, what we did was we sort of. So, Najib, have you yeah. considered putting into that model something that would actually generate a trade off where perhaps like, you value diversity uh, in some way, or you, know, you can get some benefit from someone who's connected to your neighbor, but not from other people that would lead you to want to have things that are like, more spread out so that you can get like, the value of trading with someone who's in some sense far away, but then that gets traded off against the possibility. So we... we bounty your degree, for example, by five and makes a network 500 people. Pardon me? Why bound your degree by the dumbbell number and makes a network large. No, no, but that's, so he's already done that. But I've the already thing, done that. So I've said... But the thing that he doesn't have, Christian, is that like there's no reason in his framework well, you shouldn't just be tightly knit in the sense that, like, you know, there's no extra benefit that you would get by sort of being indirectly connected to someone who's really far away as you would in, like, a Graves' check. example, right? In Graves' example, you, there's a huge value to, like, having someone who's eventually connected to China because they can bring spices over from China, right? So that gives you a natural incentive not to have a clique because, you know, Basically, comparative advantage means that it's good to be connected to someone else. It'd be nice to have some model where you have your motive, but then there's also this motive to get connected to people far away, and so there becomes like some trade-off between those things. So, uh, so you could have like a theory of optimal uh, societies or something like absolutely, that. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, so it's 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 put this way. It's in the it was in the NSF proposal in terms of thinking about it from the perspective <laughs> of risk sharing. Yeah. It hasn't materialized into a paper um, yeah. because of lack of tractability. Yeah, yeah. So you'll see the challenge, the fundamental challenge that we have here is, you know, in most repeated game settings, it's incredibly hard to say anything concrete for a fixed discount factor. And one of the constraints that may perhaps I imposed on my co-author, he comes from repeated games, I did not, is to say, look, we're people's preferences are people's preferences. We shouldn't be proving results saying what would happen if people had a certain set of preferences. We should be holding fixed a discount factor. And for a fixed discount factor, try to figure out what would be the optimal equilibrium and the optimal network structure. So that's sort of been a constraint that, we've ha that we have and part of the, the difficulty we have in proving this result. Okay. In particular, because for a fixed discount factor, and now actually for most networks, I'll, I'll tell I'll, I'll show you, you're not able to even, we know of no methods that could find the best equilibrium for any for, for, for a network. So we have to have a very indirect argument here to be able to prove that this is, uh, we have an equilibrium on this network that's better. Question, yes. Which is, um, why would I have not thought that this was going to be the answer? Was there a countervailing intuition that one might have had that might have led one to think that this would not be the answer you would have got? Um, so th this is actually, you know, so, this, so this, this paper, this project, this long-term project divides into two sorts of pieces which are somewhat interesting because lesson number one is one where the intuition is so incredibly clear and yet it's amazing, at least for us, how difficult the math is. Okay. Yeah. The second paper I'm going to tell you, it's one in which the, in, it, the result moved by most audiences strike them as being incredibly unintuitive. Okay. The math, it's actually very easy to prove. Cool. Okay. Um, so yes, I, do, I don't have a great countervailing intuition except it would be great. It would be great to be able to capture why the math is hard to prove in some sense. That would be the intuition. Yeah. Okay. So here's the thing that's counterintuitive, which is, if you were suppose you were to do what the literature has done and say assume communication is truthful, then permanent ostracism, where if I deviate on anyone, I'm permanently ostracized. That's actually the best equilibrium. But this is a this is an assumption we don't like. So let's suppose instead that someone tells the truth only if it's in their interest to do so. What we prove in that context is that permanent ostracism can't do anything better than what bilateral grim trigger could have done. Meaning, community enforcement here is going to be completely redundant. So that tells you the strength of these communication incentive constraints that getting, getting Christian, making Christian willing to tell the truth that Najib deviated is going to be such a binding constraint 
that he's not going to be willing to do so unless the level of cooperation we have in society is very low. Can you give some model a little bit more? Because it's not quite clear to me what my incentive, what the yeah. game is you're playing here in which I... Perfect. Here we go. Okay. So, three players, and Bob and Carol, they're going to interact repeatedly in continuous time. They have a common discount rate of R. And each link is going to meet at exponentially distributed arrival times governed by parameter lambda. And then when they meet, until they meet, or until a link meets, everyone's just twiddling their thumbs. When a link meets, they play a prisoner's dilemma. Okay? And the constraint is that everyone observes activity only on her own link. So this is a, a game where people are interacting asynchronously. And at any given time, at most one link is recognized. And Anne and Bob are the only ones who observe when they meet and what happens when they meet. Okay? So what happens when people meet? They're going to talk. Then they're going to select stakes. Then they're going to play a prisoner's dilemma with those stakes. Okay, what do, so I want to go a little bit more into this extensive form here. I'll talk about the the talking in a moment. So Christian, just hold on to your question for a few seconds. Um, what players are going to do is they're going to decide what size of project to work at. You could have a lot of different games by which this is decided, but here's a sort of a simple game. I say, you know, I want to work on a project of size 0.5. Someone says they want to work on a project of size 0.8. The minimum of our two numbers is picked, so it's a project of size 0.5. What does it mean to have a project of size 0.5? It's going to come in straight into our prisoner's dilemma, where if we both work, we get the stakes that we had in that, the, the stakes that were selected. So the if, 0.5. 0.5, exactly. If I shirk while my partner works, I get this extra temptation bonus. I get 0.5 plus 0.5 squared. This is what my partner, the sucker, gets. And if we both shirk, we each get payoffs of zero. Why are we doing this game? So there are multiple reasons. One is that stakes are going to be a sort of nice way of measuring the level of cooperation. And it's a different way than what repeated game theorists usually do. Usually we measure the level of cooperation by the minimum possible discount factor to sustain a particular level of uh, fixed payoffs where players are working. In some sense, we're looking, we're looking at the mathematical dual problem. We're fixing the discount rate, looking for the maximum level of cooperation. Uh, as we discovered, this is actually more tractable as an approach than the conventional approach. And in some sense, it's more realistic as well. I mean, we, we typically believe that in most relationships, people can adjust the level of cooperation that they want to have. Okay. You know, there's actually something in Stigler that goes sort of back to this, where he asks how big of a uh, like collusive cartel can you form for a given type of environment? <coughs> and the like, the bigger and more ambitious the cartel is, the easier it is for it to fall apart. And so you sort of like measure things not by like, can you get cooperation or not for a given discount, but his way of thinking about it was like, how much of an elevation of price and of cost can you achieve? Through it. So it's, it's interesting. We're going to get, yeah. great to get the reference. So, so um, we, when writing this paper, originally we claimed credit for this variable stakes environment. And then multiple people who we don't think really wrote a variable stakes environment have been telling us we should act, attribute credit to them for writing a variable stakes environment. Um, so now we have a massive list of things of other papers that have similar kinds of environments. Um, so the great Stigler would be a better for a neutral party. To that's right. Uh, okay. So now, you know, the way, best way of showing how tractable this is is to just think about different equilibria. So now let's go back to bilateral grim trigger where you're going to work with a partner if and only if that partner has never cheated you. So someone's thinking about, should I work or cheat today? If I cheat, this is my one-time gain from cheating. Or I could work, in which case I get phi today. And every time we meet in the future, I'm going to get phi. So at some point t in the future, which I'm going to discount appropriately, I might meet the person, which happens with a probability of lambda dt, in that time period, and at th that time, I'm going to get phi. Okay, so it's it probably trivial, but is it trivial that once I've decided not to cheat, that then I should never cheat because maybe I want to not it's one cheat? One shot deviation. So, one shot deviation. Yeah. Okay. 
So in this, in, in this setting with bilateral grim trigger, so the one-shot deviation principle is going to fail in things I'm going to show in a couple of slides. But here it is true. One-shot deviation principle doesn't fail. And so, so, this, so this is the, and once this player has cheated, so here's a simple way of doing it in this variable stakes environment. Once this player has cheated, that partner who he's cheated on is always going to set stakes of zero in every future interaction. Once he sets stakes of zero in every future interaction, there's no game in some sense to be played. Everything's going to be. Is it, this is a particular policy you're choosing? Uh, so this is actually the best you could do with any bilateral enforcement scheme. And so bilateral enforcement is? Is you work with someone if and only if that person has never cheated you in the past. You don't care about what this person's done to other people. So I'm just doing this as a lower bound for what community enforcement should be able to achieve. It's never worked That's right. So it's not like something perfect or whatever. It is, this is this is this is this is a sub game perfect equilibrium. This famous proof that among all sub game perfect equilibria, which only depend on the history between you and that person, the best such one is the Grim Trigger one. That's like a classical result. Grim Trigger means theory. that you, you you don't play once you've been cheated. Exactly. Yeah, that, that, so that, you don't cooperate among again. Among all bilateral things, yeah. that, that is the, the one thing that one reason why the famous uh, result doesn't apply in our context, I should mention, is because because of the variable stakes. So you could imagine wanting to vary the stakes on the basis of your history, higher stakes, and so on and so forth. But we proved that that's a complication that's not going to, that's not going to create a complication here. So the best you could do with this, and as I said, I'm, doing this, I'm setting this as a lower bound for what you could do with a network. Sort of a little, when, when people look at these um, evolutionary game series, they sometimes have different situations, right, where people Sort tit of for tat. tit for tat, and where they sort of cheat, but it's sort of good from time to time for give. So that's not the case. Here. That's right. That's right. Well, I mean, so, they can work well in different environments, but this is a complete information environment, essentially. So this is a this is a complete information environment, and in some sense, typically when we're so if we had a if we had a fixed stakes game, if I fixed fee, and then I'm varying the discount factor, if players are patient enough. And you can always enforce mutual effort by saying, look, I'm only going to punish you for three periods, and then we're going to come back and not punish you anymore. So that's why you could even do that. You could even have an optimal equilibrium take that form with fixed stakes. Once you have variable stakes, it's going to be optimal, at least with two, with two players, it's going to be optimal to make the punishment as harsh as possible. And permanent punishments are going to be harsher than these temporary punishments, and that's why it can enforce more. What would happen if you had uh, perfect monitoring? So if everyone observed everything, and now you wanted to think about ostracism, you'd say you're going to work with someone if and only if that person has never cheated anyone. So you've got the same gain from shirking today, same gain from working today. But the difference now is when, the, when Anne is thinking about shirking on Bob, she says, look, I'm, I'm going to lose my relationships with both Bob and Carol, hence the two. And now you can once again figure out what's the best equilibrium you could have in this form. For this particular parameterization, by the way, this is just an example, you could get, you'd get twice as well as you would with just bilateral grim trigger. Okay. Now this is, of course, heroic. We don't expect people to be able to perfectly observe anything, everything. And so the question is, who's going to conceal this information? So let's take the first uh, blush at this, which is suppose that Anne has shirked. Clearly, Anne does not want to tell Carol that Anne has shirked. If anyone does, you'd hope that Bob would do so, but Anne wouldn't want to self-incriminate herself. So for now, we're going to assume that Bob communicates truthfully. We're going to return to that, but we're now going to uh, no longer assume that Anne communicates truthfully about what she's done in the past. So we've got the same social norm, but now monitoring is no longer perfect. Anne asks herself, should I work with Bob or not? If I cheat on Bob, I'm going to get this immediately. If I stay on the equilibrium path, these are my payoffs, as before. And if I cheat on Bob, there's a chance I might be able to cheat on Carol in the future. The only way for me to do this is if I can meet Carol before Bob meets Carol. So at some future time, T, I might meet Carol and be able to cheat on her. I can only do this successfully 
if it's the case that Bob and Carol haven't met yet, and if it's the case that I haven't met Carol yet and already shirked on her because I can only fool her once, I can't fool her twice. Okay. So this is now once again. You're assuming the same process by which people communicate is the process by which they're trading. That's right. So there's no, there's no, have you explored models? It's, it's very like, easy to generalize it and allow for information. Like just to, information trade, yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah. It's very so the easy. The result still holds. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay, so uh, this isn't bilateral. The, so the highest stakes that you can have are now going to be somewhere between what you had with just bilateral enforcement and perfect monitoring. Okay. Now, we're achieving this in a Nash equilibrium where the assumption is that Bob and Carol, Bob communicates truthfully to Carol. If you wanted to get rid of that assumption, you could always achieve this in what's called a contagion equilibrium, where once Anne shirks on Bob, Bob says, to hell with it, I'm going to shirk on everybody. Whoever gets shirked on by Bob also says, to hell with it, I'm going to shirk on everybody. So then now Anne says, I don't want to shirk on Bob, because now it's going to lead society into this downward trajectory where we're all shirking on each other. So that's a simple way of being able to implement it using a sequential equilibrium, which is what game theorists love doing. Um, but people in my own department who are not game theorists find such equilibria counterintuitive and don't like them, which is why, for the most part, I'm going to talk about ostracism. An idea that a lot of people find appealing is that when someone shirks on me, I punish the guilty, we, direct, we target our punishments towards the guilty, and we try to preserve relationships between innocent people. All of these are within constant factors, right? Like, am I missing something here? Because the previous one was like two lateral two. over. This yeah. one, this is basically one factor, right? So, so you know, an R is big or small, it's always like two. two. That's right. So, so, when, so when R is small in some sense, you shouldn't be that interested in community enforcement. If right. people are very patient, you can, get, you can do very well with just bilateral and but R is small in the sense when this number is big, right? And sure. So that's sort of the regime where the stakes are, like, well, the payoffs are big. The payoffs are big, that's right. On the other hand, if you were to believe that there were some sort of maximum stakes out there that any relationship can have, maximum payoffs, if you had to, were to impose that sort of upper bound, then with bilateral enforcement, you'd be able to reach that upper bound if R was sufficiently small. So let me, so the intuition for the cliques is relatively simple, as you, we've seen. So if you had a circle of three M individuals, where M is any number greater than one, and if Anne shirks on Bob, then Bob's going to shirk on Carol, Carol's going to shirk on David, and Anne is very likely in this big circle to meet Professor X before he learns from White that this has happened. And so then the best stakes you could have in the circle are definitely going to be less than what you could have in the triangle. And so you're going to want to divide the society from the circle into m different triangles. So that's sort of the, the intuition for it. Um, let me tell you now where we sort of uh, had some uh, technical difficulties with this. So more generally, a player's incentive to work is going to hinge on how quickly her other partners learn about it if she shirks. So this is a term that we didn't find in the literature, which we call the viscosity of a network. And what's the viscosity of a network capturing, which is if player i shirts on player j at time 0, what's player i going to ask her, herself? She's going to say, let me think about a neighbor, player k, and say, think about the probability that player k doesn't know by some future time s plus t that I'm guilty. So this is player I has shirked on player J, and she's thinking about what's the chance I'll be able to successfully shirk on my other neighbor, player K. But what is S here? Oh, S is just some future time. So she shirked at, oh, time zero. Oh, S is zero. Yeah, S is zero, yeah, perfect. Uh, she, that should be a time S. Yeah. OK. So she's going to ask herself, what's the probability that this, other, this third party doesn't know I'm guilty by a certain time? If the player doesn't know I'm guilty at that time, then I'm going to discount whatever payoffs I get at that time accordingly, and I'm going to get this. So one way in which I think about this game is um, suppose 
Suppose my wife is expecting. So I, uh, at the time at which I was thinking about this, she was expecting. Suppose she's expecting, and I know whoever I tell that my wife is expecting, they're going to go around telling everyone else that my wife, Najib's expecting a baby. Did you hear Najib's expecting a baby? Now, I want to get the joy of being the first person to tell my friends. And so now I'm going to have to think about what is my expected payoff in the game. And that's actually what's, what viscosity is capturing. Now, if my friends, if it were a tree, that would be awesome. Because then anyone I say doesn't know anyone else. And I get all the payoffs from being able to share this good news. On the other hand, when everyone's very connected, Information is going to travel quickly, and that's when a network is going to have low viscosity. And it would suck in that game, it's great in this game. Okay. So what are my general incentives? So now I've replaced a fee plus fee squared with any temptation payoff. So player says, player I says, should I shirk on player J? If I do so, I get this temptation bonus today. If I work, I get the stakes from working with player J and all my discounted expected utility from stakes of working with all my other neighbors. Now when I shirk on player J, information about this is going to spread to all my other neighbors. And only if it's the case that they, information hasn't spread to them, then I can shirk on them and get this payoff of being able to shirk, uh, the temptation to shirk. Otherwise, they're going to know I'm guilty they're going to set stakes of zero, and I'm going to get zero payoff. Okay. So that's a general incentive to work. This is one case where we always had in mind of replacing this generic x with some variable that meant something, because when we came up with the x, it was something we didn't know how to analyze. Um, we never ended up replacing it, because we still don't really know how to analyze it particularly well, but we were able to sidestep it. So there's no closed form. We looked. There's no closed form that we could find for what viscosity would be, except for two cases where we could compute it. Trees and a complete graph. And we knew that if there's a cycle from one player to that player, so in other words, if there's a way that information could spread from one of my neighbors to another of my neighbors, then the viscosity between these two neighbors of mine has to be less than the viscosity I would have in a tree. A tree is the worst case scenario. We have an algorithm to compute viscosity, but it's nothing that we could use in our incentive constraints. So this, Glenn and Greg, was exactly the challenge we faced in saying, how could we prove this is the best equilibrium when we can't even compute something that's featuring in every incentive constraint? Okay. So now let me skip these on where we computed. So, we looked at cliques, and so the first thing we were able to do is to say, if we had a network in which the maximal degree is D, then for every pair of links, we were able to prove that the viscosity has to be higher than the viscosity that you have in the clique. Even though we're not able to uh, solve for what this is in closed form, we were able to use a coupling argument that coupled the information process on a clique with how information would travel on any other network and show point-wise, in some sense, for all of these paths, information would travel weakly faster on the clique. Okay. So that was sort of the first sort of step in the result. The second result was trying to say, figure out what this implied for equilibrium incentives. So I want to go back here for a second. This is a incentive constraint. But we're now living in a world, coming back to Christian's question, where the one-shot deviation principle doesn't hold. So it's not clear that when player I is going to cheat, that she's going to then choose to sequentially cheat on everyone else. In particular, what I might want to do is I might want to cheat on Christian, but then when I meet Greg, not cheat on him, because I want to slow down the rate at which everyone knows I'm a cheater. And this was, this was a fundamental challenge. For a fixed discount factor, we know, uh, and every repeated games theorist we've spoken to, knows of no way of figuring out what is the frontier of this equilibrium set. One of the things that sort of came out relatively crazily is us realizing that whatever the equilibrium might be, you always will face an incentive constraint of this form. Namely, it can never be in anyone's interest to cheat forever on whoever she meets. 
Now, this may not be a tight incentive constraint, but as it turns out, this incentive constraint is enough for us to be able to rank equilibria on the clique with any equilibrium on any network in this class of networks. And so that's how we were able to prove that if you were to just look at equilibrium in which everyone works, no one is going to be able to do better than the payoff that they would get on the clique in the equilibrium I described. If uh, working has strategic complements where you don't want to sort of trade schemes or sometimes I shirk like Glenn work and then sometimes uh, I work and let him shirk, then any other equilibrium on any of these networks can't do better in terms of average utility than what we have. And one of the things that contrasts us from standard repeated games is that our comparisons are for all parameters. When you say strategic complements, it mean, do you mean that the my, it, payoff is no, I don't. What I mean is that my marginal incentive to work in the stage game is increasing when you're working relative to when you're shirking. Yeah. OK, so now I'm going to come back to the question of truth telling. Anne has shirked on Bob. Does Bob want to tell Carol that Anne has shirked on Bob? This is the result that's counterintuitive, but the math um, is too easy um, for us to have been convinced that we did something correct for a long time. So you hope that Bob would. And now here's the constraint. If Bob tells the truth, they're going to ostracize Anne, give her the boot. And then you've got Bob and Carol left with each other. They have to be willing to work with each other, because this is an ostracism equilibrium where they're innocent, they're going to want to work with each other, but they're not going to want to work with Anne. For them to be willing to work with each other in the future once they've ostracized Anne, it can't be that their stakes in that history are anything better than, bigger than the bilateral stakes. So they have to reduce their relationship, say, look, we're not going to work on that high-term project because that stick and carrot through Anne is no longer available. We're going to work on a lower scale project. And so now let's think about Bob's incentives. He can either reveal that Anne had shirked, work at the bilateral stakes forever with Carol, or he can conceal this from Anne and shirk at the equilibrium path stakes. So just to describe the communication protocol here, how it works, is when Anne goes along meeting different people, she has to write down truthfully in her diary everything that happened. She cannot lie in her diary. But then when she meets someone, she decides which pages of her diary to show and which pages of her diary to not show. Because she she's the only one who knows how many pages in her diary there is. And this is a magical diary. I know we don't expect diaries of truth telling here. Um, but that, the reason we're sort of looking at a disclosure game rather than a cheap talk game is because we want to stack the deck against us. We want to show that permanent ostracism has very difficult incentive constraints. And even if you were to allow information to be verifiable in this way, you're still going to find that it's going to be hard to support these equilibria. Uh, you have an incentive to report that someone is a cheater even though he's honest. That's exactly right. That's right. So, so, so one way of putting this is you could imagine writing down a whole series of reasons why you could think this could fail. One is that he says, she says with cheap talk. One is that you might want to sully people's reputations um, and you have other incentives to do so in a competitive sort of setting. We're trying to show that even if you were to take all of those other problems away, a problem was, is still going to remain. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's not completely obvious because it could be that Yael's incentive interacts negatively with your incentive. They sort of cancel each other out and they create a countervailing incentive that actually makes cooperation easier. That's right, but I think in all of these cases, it's just compounding the problem of being willing to. I mean, here I'm going to give you one history. Over reporting. Yours leads to under reporting. Right. But at different histories. A different history. So yeah, yeah L's case is one in which you, you know, someone wants to sully the reputation of someone who hasn't been cooperating. Right. Here I'm showing that you don't want to reveal when someone hasn't been cooperating. Yeah. Um, so OK, so let me talk, let's think through this, what this, exactly what this incentive constraint is that Bob faces. So he's been cheated on by Carol Ann. And he says, I can either act as if life is good and cheat on Carol, in which case I get this. 
Or I can tell the truth to Carol, in which case we're going to change our relationship so that we're now cooperating at bilateral stakes. I get those bilateral stakes today and every time I meet in the future. Now, of course, the definition of the bilateral stakes are those that equated the one-time gain from shirking with my lifetime gain from working at them. And now the combination of this inequality and this equality tells you that your equilibrium path stakes can't exceed your bilateral stakes. Now, I didn't anticipate having time to get into the formalism of this, so I'll tell you about intuition. This is a setting in which forgiveness is going to help. So remember, we're coming back to uh, the question about permanent versus temporary punishments. If you didn't have this communication incentive constraint, there's no reason to have temporary punishments. You want to have permanent punishments because you want to have the harshest possible stick. But having that harshest possible stick impedes the incentive to communicate truthfully. The way in which it impedes incentive to communicate truthfully is it's destroying too much social collateral. When Anne is being ostracized, she's no longer available as a carrot and stick in Bob and Carol's relationship. And taking her out of from being a carrot and stick is, is hurting that relationship and thereby hurting Bob's willingness to tell the truth. Another way of phrasing the intuition, suppose our result weren't true. Suppose it's the case that permanent ostracism could do better. The reason Bob and Carol could do better than bilateral grim trigger is each of them knows that if either party defects on the other, they're going to be punished by Anne. But Bob privately knows now in this off-path history that Anne has shirked on him. He privately knows that this incentive is no longer available for him, but Carol doesn't know that this incentive is no longer available for him. And he doesn't have an incentive to let Carol know. The situation is analogous to imagine that you were a boss and you hired two workers to supervise each other, as in peer monitoring. And one of the workers sees that there's some person who's supposed to monitor him is constantly playing on the Xbox. It's not monitoring him. Now, you would hope that this worker tells the boss, but this worker says, wait a minute, I'm no longer being monitored. I should instead play the Xbox too. And that's exactly the fundamental problem that comes up out here, is that when Bob knows that he no longer has the punishment to bear from Anne, he doesn't want to let Carol know that. So the one thing that's a bit weird here is that the game doesn't change at all when we take you off the island. So if I'm a whistleblower, I might hope that I get some sort of transport bonus from my boss, or perhaps that we interact more in the future since there's nobody else left in our social group. It seems like in this game, everything else is held fixed after the following Yeah, so, okay, so let me tell you about the two things. So, this, so this, this paper, we presented it a whole bunch of places, and every place we presented it to, people presented things that could break the result. Um, and then it grew to be a 60-page paper, and then our referees have told us, take these 40 pages of extensions and put them in a supplementary appendix. Um, so I'll, I'll, we, we thought about both of those. So let's first talk about what happens if this frequency of interaction can be rescaled. So Bob and Carol meet more often. Then you'd want to think about what does bilateral enforcement mean in that case when you just have two players. That gives you a new benchmark, and then permanent ostracism can't do better than that new benchmark. Okay? The other one is somewhat interesting of what happens if when Bob tells Carol, Carol says, look, that was an awesome thing that you just did. I'm going to make you this transfer. And then after that, we're going to continue playing this, but I'm going to make you this transfer as a way of rewarding you for sharing that information. Um, in those equilibria, what you're going to have is no player can do, and so we apply this for general games, no player can do better than the best payoff they could have had in any bilateral equilibrium in a permanent ostracism. So it generalizes the bound, but, but not by too much. And, and when the bound changes, and I'm now comparing across different ostracism, so I get a bound for ostracism, and now I'm going to think about a, a thing with forgiveness. It's going to be clear that forgiveness is still better than ostracism. That's right. That's right. I mean, I, another version of what Greg said, which I think actually probably is an, an important factor in these types of situations, is honor. If Imagine that there's some chance that you find out without me telling what happened in my relationship with you, or that Greg does. If upon learning 
that I didn't report your cheating on me, other people now think that they can get away with cheating on me. That is a reason why I might want to report any time you cheat on me. You see what? I, I, I see the I see the intuition. Um, yeah. Even in larger societies, though, this, so so I should I should mention something. The fact that you can't do better than bilateral stakes isn't something that's coming out of us having three players. This is true across all networks, regardless of the population size. You can never do better. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so then you'd want to look at histories where everyone has shirked on me except for Greg. And now I'm trying to say think about. This incentive constraint. Do I want to tell Greg that he and I are the only cooperative members left? I see, and then you can backward induct from that. I'm a bit troubled by this. So, you know, I'm troubled by this because, you know, as an equilibrium, as a modeler, I'm allowed to pick my history and check the incentive constraints at those history, regardless of how crazy that history seems. I'm uncomfortable with this, but it's, it's how we test for equilibrium. Uh, I'm testing well, maybe, flash maybe one problem is that. Our intuition that ostracism is the right thing arises from somewhat larger societies, and that in histories, when we get down to just two people or three people or four people, we would actually have different types of equilibria, but we don't have good intuitions for what those would be because we're used to living in societies that are larger. Fair enough. So we actually, in the paper, we have uh, equilibria to bridge contagion and ostracism, where after a certain number of people shirk on me, yeah. I say, to hell with it, I'm going to shirk on everyone. Mm -hmm. But until that point, I'm still, I trust anyone who thinks seems innocent to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So the reason forgiveness helps, I think you guys see, is permanent ostracism destroying social collateral. If you had temporary ostracism, now I've got some future social collateral of Anne being re-entered into the fold. Now that's going to reduce Anne's incentives to work, but it's going to improve Bob's incentives to communicate the truth. And we show that you can balance these two so that you can actually do better. Great. So let me conclude. So um, the way in which we sort of viewed this project is sort of a lot of the prior literature when thinking about community enforcement assumes information diffusion almost as in a mechanical process. The first thing we did was we made that same assumption and thought about if you assume it, what would be the best kind of network to have? The second project then wanted to think about this assumption more critically and realize that information flows and monitoring are strategic choices. Someone is monitoring, monitored when someone else chooses to monitor them. Someone spreads rumors and gossip when they make that choice to do so. And as soon as you model communication, you find that the equilibria that people in the literature um, across the social sciences and theoretical biology that people have been studying don't give victims incentives to tell the whole truth. And instead, temporary ostracism, having some forgiveness, is going to help with communication. Great. Sorry, I'm over time. Give you or ostracize you, or whether I'm good. It depends a little bit on how I view the world as an agent, or whether I think the world in a moral hazard or adverse selection kind of way. I think I've just learned that you are now and forever a bad person. Then really, it seems like we should ostracize you. Uh, but if I learn that you know possibly in the future you could play the game in a nice way again, then maybe I want to think a little bit harder about what I communicate to other people. That, that's right. That's right. So if you were to Think about this as trying, we're trying to um, discipline both moral hazard and adverse selection issues. You might want to use ostracism at the initial stages to screen out and kick out all of those folks. Right. And then once you know that everyone in, uh, left in the room are the, the good type of people, right. um, then you, don't, you no longer want to use ostracism. Yeah, exactly. Or in, you just described before that you had some things where you might do some things when it's a large community and other things. Do you have a sense of whether uh, ostracism in a, the large community part it can achieve close to the optimum? So we have so when you want to do mix ostracism with contagion, yeah. the contagion in the smaller community is going to give us incentive constraints on communication up to that stage. Yes. Okay. So you're never going to be able to do better with ostracism than you can with contagion, and in fact, you'll do strictly worse. No, I, th so. that, that I understand, but I mean, if you started putting in incomplete information in some sense, 
you could sort of see why contagion wouldn't be a very good thing to I, do early on. And I wonder whether you could get a theory that would actually pick out ostracism as being optimal on certain parts of the game tree, but not obviously. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm sure if we were to take that model where we're trying to make contagion and opti uh, ostracism, yeah. and includes, introduce some incomplete information about types, different types, yeah. um, we would be able to. Or noisy observations exactly. or yeah. something. We might be able to do that. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>